Sherry, and last but not least, we have Emma McBride presenting her first year project from the Greeson Lab on uncoupling physiological and emotional responses to stress with mindfulness, relevance to psychosomatic medicine. Hi everyone, um, I'm really happy to be here today and talk to you guys a little bit about what I've been working on this past year. My project is titled Uncoupling Emotional and Heart Rate Reactivity Relevance to Mindfulness-Based Interventions. So uh, during this presentation, I'm going to take a moment to just review some concepts that we might be a little bit less familiar with, namely equanimity and concordance, and then we will proceed through the methods, results, and discussion. So to start us off by talking about stress and stress reactivity, chronic stress is epidemic in North America and is linked to negative health outcomes like cardiovascular disease or anxiety or depression. When we study stress reactivity, what we're doing is trying to learn more about the way that our bodies and minds respond to acute stress in the lab so that we can better inform stress management interventions like mindfulness-based interventions. A lot of things happen in our bodies and minds when we're exposed to acute stress. Today, I am only going to talk about two of those things. One is your heart starts beating faster. And the second is that you have a psychological response, here conceptualized as an increase in negative affect. This diagram here is from John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full Catastrophe Living, and illustrates the stress buffering hypothesis. Under the stress buffering hypothesis, we expect a mindful response to attenuate stress reactivity, to buffer it. So if someone's mindful and they're exposed to acute stress, we would expect, as we see on the right side here, lower heart rate reactivity and lower negative affect reactivity in response to that stressor. In contrast, in someone who's not mindful, we'd expect both those things to go up. We'd expect the responses to be higher. So what this model doesn't get at is whether or not what happens in your body and what happens in your mind agree with one another. So what's the degree of correlation between what's going on cardiovascularly and what's going on psychologically? And how does that relate to whether or not someone is or is not mindful? That brings us to this concept of equanimity. I am essentially suggesting that when we take equanimity into account, it urges us to look at stress reactivity and mindfulness in a somewhat different way. So what is equanimity? I have a definition up here. It says the capacity not to be caught up in what happens to us. So it's kind of similar to these concepts that we're a little bit more familiar with, like non-reactivity and decentering. so stepping back. But what does it mean for stress reactivity? So essentially, I think what equanimity means is that we have to look at this in a different way. We have to look at whether or not your body is doing the same thing as your mind is doing during a stress response. This idea comes from the work of Yuval Hadash and his team out of Israel. They propose what's called the decoupling model of equanimity, where in someone who's high in equanimity, we see an uncoupling of subjective aversion from unpleasant experiences. So someone who's high in, in equanimity might experience something unpleasant, so like we all do over the course of our lives, and they might not experience the same reaction of, I need to push this away, or I need to fix it, I need to get away from this. So subjective aversion is lower, the unpleasant experience is still there, but the two are uncoupled. So this is their proposed way to conceptualize equanimity. So what does this mean for the way that we understand mindfulness and stress reactivity? We can picture in someone who is low in equanimity, they have a cardiovascular stress response, so maybe your heart rate goes up because you're giving an important presentation, and that is coupled with subjective aversion. So this psychological experience of, I don't like this, I need to get away, I need to fix this. The two go together. If one goes up, the other one goes up too. So in someone with high equanimity, perhaps this proposes the two are no longer coupled together. So maybe the heart rate response still happens because you're still giving the presentation, it's still a little bit scary. But there's not necessarily that subjective aversion of I need to push this away, I need to fix it right now, I need to get out of here. The two don't go together anymore. So this brings us to this concept of concordance. Essentially what we're suggesting here is that it might not be enough to just look at the magnitude of the stress response and mindfulness's effect on that magnitude. We might also have to look at the degree of correlation between different aspects of the stress response. Namely, heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity, which is how I'm going to conceptualize it here. So this is not a new concept. So essentially what we're proposing is that lower concordance, uncoupling, is a good thing. So when heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity aren't as tied together, that's maybe a marker of someone being mindful. In contrast, higher concordance, not as good of a thing, not mindful. So this concept actually comes out of a 2016 paper that Dr. Greeson did with Dr. Greg Feldman, in which they found that folks who had higher dispositional mindfulness, and these are people who've never meditated before, just a college sample, 
of meditation naive people had lower concordance, a lower degree of agreement between what their heart rate was doing under acute stress in the lab and what negative affect was doing. <coughs> That, however, is the first analysis of its kind. It hasn't been replicated yet, and it hasn't been extended to mindfulness training. So the question that we're left with here is, could this concept of concordance perhaps serve as a biobehavioral marker of equanimity and in mindful of mindfulness? This is what we're exploring. So that brings us to our hypotheses. The first half of my first hypothesis is a replication of that Feldman 2016 study. So we're hypothesizing that overall dispositional mindfulness, non-judgment, and non-reactivity will each independently moderate the association between heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity. Similarly, we're hypothesizing that the same thing will hold after folks have gone through mindfulness-based stress reduction, so mindfulness training. Relatedly, we're extending the hypothesis to mindfulness training, so we're hypothesizing that before people do MBSR, concordance will be higher, so we're seeing that coupling, and after MBSR, we'll see an uncoupling as a response to that mindfulness training. Participants were 64 medically healthy adults enrolled in an open trial of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Age was around 40, range 22 to 64. This is a sample that skewed female and Caucasian. Um, dispositional mindfulness, which is self-reported mindfulness assessed before people had done any mindfulness training, was around where we'd expect it to be based on a community sample who's relatively highly educated and meditation naive. So this study used a pretest, post-test, repeated measures design in which subjects served as their own controls. There were two lab sessions, one before mindfulness-based stress reduction and one just after, in which participants completed self-report measures of dispositional mindfulness, as well as the anger recall task. The anger recall task is a validated stress reactivity protocol in which participants are asked to remember something that happened to them that made them angry and still makes them angry, and then talk about it with the experimenter. During that time, we're measuring heart rate and we're measuring negative affect. Relatedly, heart rate reactivity was calculated by subtracting someone's mean baseline heart rate, so before the anger recall task, from their mean heart rate during the anger recall task. Negative affect reactivity was the same, but there's only one time point. We just asked participants at baseline and then just after the anger recall task. So baseline negative affect gets subtracted from anger recall negative affect. We assessed negative affect using an internally generated 10 item measure in which participants were asked to rate how intensely they were feeling a given negative emotion like anxious at the present moment on a 10 point Likert scale. Dispositional mindfulness was assessed using the five facet mindfulness questionnaire. This is particularly useful in this context because it let us look at different facets of mindfulness instead of just looking at it as an overall construct. Namely, we're looking at non-judging and non-reactivity in addition to the overall FFMQ score. Non-judging is included because it was analyzed as part of the 2016 Feldman study, which this analysis is a replication of. Non-reactivity is included because of its similarity to this concept of equanimity, which is what we're trying to tap with this analysis. So this is a moderation analysis in which dispositional mindfulness and mindfulness training are being tested as moderators of the relationship between heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity. I did this analysis in SPSS and in R. So in SPSS, it's a hierarchical linear regression model in which the interaction terms, so for example, the multiplicative interaction between heart rate reactivity and mindfulness is being entered in the third step of the model, predicting change in negative affect. In R, it's the exact same analysis, just using the general linear model. Chromebox alphas were good, ranging from 0.86 to 0.94. So jumping into the results, this is the first half of our first hypothesis. So this is an analysis of whether or not mindfulness, dispositional mindfulness, moderated concordance before people have done any mindfulness training. So what we can see here on the right side is that these results were not statistically significant. However, we're going to take some time and take a look at the effect sizes because they are in fact informative. So we'll start at the top left over here. So the moderator here is overall mindfulness. We can see this standardized coefficient beta here of negative 0.2. So what does this mean? This is a standardized measure of the effect of this interaction term on our outcome variable, which was change in negative affect. Essentially what this means is that for every standard deviation increase over here of this interaction term, we can expect our outcome variable, negative affect reactivity, to go down 0.2 standard deviations. What does that mean in terms of our hypothesis? Essentially, what it ends up meaning is that as people get more mindful, the relationship between heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity, so concordance, gets more negative. So the fact that these are negative here means that the same thing is going on with these potential moderators as well. 
It's also worth looking at the semi-partial R squared. So what this tells us, at least relative to this, this uh, model R squared up at the top, is that this interaction term, mindfulness, accounted for almost two-thirds of the variance that's accounted for by the overall model, which is pretty significant. And that is reflected over here for non-judging and non-reactivity. So this gets quite a bit clearer as we start to look at visuals. So I'll load them one at a time. This first one is um, overall mindfulness as a moderator of change in the relationship between change in heart rate and change in negative affect. So just to orient you to these graphs, they're a little small and I'm gonna put three on the screen so that we can compare them to each other. So on the x-axis here, this is change in heart rate, so heart rate reactivity. And on the y-axis here is change in negative affect. This is split up into three panels, where the first panel on the left is people who weren't very mindful, the second panel is people who are in the middle, and the third panel is people who are on the high end of mindfulness. What we hypothesized was that when people weren't, weren't very mindful, we'd see higher concordance. Higher concordance means higher degree of agreement between heart rate and negative affect, so a positive slope. We hypothesized that that concordance would then level off as people got more mindful. So that is at least visually what we see. I've also included Pearson bivariate correlations at the top here. This is obviously not part of the actual analysis. The panel divisions are arbitrary, but it helps to give us a little bit of an idea of the magnitude of the effect size at the extremes. And when we load the other ones, it helps us get a sense of whether or not we're seeing the same relationship across the board. So visually, we can see that we have higher concordance for people who are low in overall mindfulness, low in non-judging, and low in non-reactivity. And this um, correlation here, I think it is, yeah, 0.47, is the highest among them. So we're seeing quite a strong positive correlation for people who are low in non-reactivity. So that is what we hypothesized, although results are not statistically significant. So we did the same analysis after MBSR. So this is after people have done a whole course in uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and we expected to see the same thing, perhaps a little bit less so because presumably fewer people fall into that category of not very mindful at this point. However, that is not what we see. So again, results are not statistically significant. However, the um, standardized coefficient betas have switched signs. They're now positive. What this means is that as people got more mindful, the relationship between change in heart rate and change in negative affect got more positive. That's not what we hypothesized that we'd see. It's worth noting that the effect sizes for non-reactivity are biggest here. So again, the semi-partial R squared is accounting for almost two thirds of the variance that's accounted for by the overall model, which is interesting when we take a look at the graphs. I'll load them all at the same time now. So non-reactivity is down here. What we're seeing is the reverse of what we saw before. So these are the people who were particularly non-reactive, which you'll remember is good. It's good to be non-reactive. That's our tapping into this concept of equanimity. We hypothesized that these people would not have high concordance. They would have that uncoupling response. Um, however, it seems like the people over here are the people who are uncoupled, and the people here are the people showing high concordance. So not what we hypothesized that we'd see. That said, these results aren't statistically significant. This is a single sample, and this could easily be noise. So this is where we'll leave it for now. And it brings us into our second hypothesis, which then becomes a little bit more interesting. Um, it would be curious if we were to see this same relationship um, between mindfulness, uh, mindfulness training and concordance uh, that we saw with dispositional mindfulness, or if we saw it the other way around, the one we didn't hypothesize. That said, we see neither of those things. So these results are not statistically significant at all. Um, that is a tiny semi-partial R squared and coefficient beta, and it becomes really clear when you take a look at the graph. There is no interaction effect there. Those actually have the same Pearson correlation of 0.14. They are exactly parallel. The model R squared is so big because there's actually a main effect of group on change in negative affect. So that's what you're seeing there. So overall, neither dispositional nor trained mindfulness significantly moderated concordance between heart rate and negative affect. That said, we see some small effect sizes that indicate that maybe dispositional mindfulness is moderating concordance between heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity, wherein people who were not very mindful before MBSR showed higher concordance, which is what we hypothesized, and people who were very mindful after MBSR showed higher concordance, which is not what we hypothesized. Interestingly, the largest effect sizes were for dispositional non-reactivity. This is that concept that taps into equanimity, which is a, a big part of what inspired this analysis in the first place. So that is interesting to see that if we're seeing it anywhere, we're seeing it there. So why would we see this effect on dispositional mindfulness but not on mindfulness training? This gives me pause. Um, if 
we are wondering about the usefulness of concordance as a robust biobehavioral marker for this stuff, for equanimity or for mindfulness, we would certainly expect it to see it if it's there in response to mindfulness training, maybe not in response to dispositional mindfulness. That's not what we see. Um, so it does make me think maybe this isn't a useful biobehavioral marker of what we're trying to get at here. The flip-flop effect, so the fact that we saw what we hypothesized before MBSR but not after MBSR, is interesting. Um, and we can explain it using the sometimes questionable validity of the FFMQ in people who've never meditated before. This explanation is a little bit of a stretch and we can go into it if folks are interested. Uh, but I think it's worth saying that this is a single sample, this could be noise, and then coupled with the ambiguity of the effect of um, trained mindfulness on concordance makes me think that maybe this isn't the right direction to go down if we're, if we're starting to look at what the psychophysiology of equanimity or of mindfulness really is. So some limitations of this study. There are actually a bunch of different ways to measure concordance, and I just use one of them. We just use change scores. So if we measured negative affect at multiple time points, we could have generated a time-linked curve, so a curve for negative affect and a curve for heart rate, and then calculated a concordance value for each individual participant. Then we could have manipulated that variable like we would any other variable, which obviously we didn't have the potential to do here. We also ran multiple tests, hence the focus mainly on effect sizes. There was no control group here, which would have been really interesting to see if we saw that same flip-flop pattern that we, we saw with the intervention group, but obviously we didn't have the capacity to do that. And then as I alluded to before, before MBSR, before people have done any mindfulness training, sometimes the validity of those dispositional mindfulness questionnaires is somewhat in question. It's hard to report on how mindful you are when you don't really have an understanding of what mindfulness is quite yet. And that is the end of my presentation. So big thank you to Dr. Greeson and to the Mesh Lab team for all of their support this year. Um, all of the folks at Duke University who helped in the collection of this data and to the NCCIH as well. And to you guys, thanks. <laughs>
Um, that said, I mean, it's interesting in the context of the intervention, too, because one of the main outcomes of this work was whether or not heart rate reactivity and negative affect reactivity just went down on their own. And we do see that main effect, although this wasn't the point of, of this analysis there. But you, I suppose, could argue that people were less angry. <laughs> I wanted to. Did you want to comment on, on that? And this, so I'm realizing, so that's a great question. It also makes me realize it's kind of a methodological detail, because um, this was done in the lab at Duke. And we haven't even talked about this. But what we did was, to, to this point, <coughs> is um, that first visit, we asked them about two times when they felt angry. And when you think back to it today, it still makes you angry. And they thought of two. How angry were you at the time? Zero to ten. How stressful was it at the time? Zero to ten. But then we picked at random which one they talked about in the pre-course visit and the post-course visit. And so because those two times were randomized, they didn't differ on how angry and stressed they were as a group of 60. Um, so we did do that just to try and not make it the same one twice because then it could just be habituation. But um, beyond that, I'm not sure how much that then ties into this whole kind of coupling concept. Yeah, or, yeah, or the flip-flopping of it. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, did you look at the potential role of trauma or adverse childhood experiences? And just thinking, like, listening to all of this, particularly, like, the, the lab task when you're thinking about the thing that made you angry, yeah. and I just feel like people could really differ depending on kind of the history they have in terms of the variables that you're looking at. Um, you know, if somebody's thinking about like, oh, you know, somebody cut me off on the highway yesterday versus like that really big bad thing that happened to me and like how, what the implications for that might be. Like, is that something you can control for? Or like, how do you think about that related to your research? So it's funny you ask that because one of my questions going into this and an analysis that I actually did for this project, but that wasn't included um, because the presentation was too long. Um, I wanted to look at the clinical usefulness of concordance as a biobehavioral marker for psychopathology as well. So there's actually some indication, there's some work that was done in folks with PTSD, showing that people with PTSD actually have that higher coupling response as symptomatology increases. So yeah, I think it's relevant. As far as what people are remembering on the anger recall task and whether or not it's dramatic, we don't have that data, I don't believe. Um, um, kind of handwritten down on it, which we haven't looked at it, but it's sort of yeah. in yeah. files and folders. But I don't remember just having done them. I don't remember kind of more childish stuff. It was more kind of like um, uh, just stuff with a, a spouse or a boss or a, kind of just things that were like some sort of injustice or not being treated fairly. But I don't remember just right offhand people going back to was sort there, of- I know that like the stressful then had to reach a certain threshold for us to use it, but could it go too high? Could you say, no, we're not going to use that one? I don't think we did that. Um, I mean, I could definitely do yeah. that. Yeah, no, it's interesting to hear about because I would hypothesize the same thing about the coupling, but I don't know what it's really like. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, what thought that occurred to me? It's not a sex question. Oh. Was no, was that, I, I don't know. Someone else spoke. Was it Ash? Yeah, I was that's not really the thing. Go ahead. Abby. Um, or Abby will talk now. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing with heart rate reactivity is that for people that have trauma or have substance abuse or things like that, that variable just tends to be a little bit weird. And people go back and forth and why that is and which way it's weird. That's but true, actually. Looking at this data, 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 when you look at it with people who are higher in depression and anxiety symptoms, the heart rate response is actually attenuated. It's like smaller buffer to this variability. Last question. Oh, that's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's it. Um, so uh, just the thought that occurred to me. Um, so, uncoupling is basically non-reactivity, right? Maybe. That's the question that I'm asking. Okay. Just, okay, go ahead. I mean, the idea that I'm positing, right, is that uncoupling is non-reactivity to your own interoceptive experience. Mm -hmm. Like, your heart is beating faster, and so non-reactivity is not freaking out mm -hmm. about that. So, you're, the, what, what is happening in your body is uncoupled from what's uh -huh. happening in your body. But non-reactivity is probably broader conceptually than okay. that. You can be non-reactive to lots of stuff, mm -hmm. either inside your body or not. Isn't it non-reactivity to the reactivity? To the inner experience. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Non-reactivity to physiological. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I meditated before I came here and had this really.
really weird meta moment where I had like a thought and my heart started beating fast. <laughs> and then, yeah, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm like living my presentation right now. <laughs> but yeah, it is. It's non-reactivity to what's going on inside your body. It could be non-reactivity to an automatic thought too. Thank you, Emma. Great presentation. Thank you, everybody.